Welcome! I'm Ruth Unger Miranda and I'm coming to you live from the Ashokan Center. Um, maybe some of you have been here before, maybe not, but we're really excited that you're here right now virtually. Uh, we're really proud to be a welcoming and inclusive space with uh, a computer that's a little too loud. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, we're, as I was saying, we are really proud to be a welcoming place where adults and kids can show up and learn and celebrate and do all sorts of great stuff. Right now, we can't welcome people to be on site physically, but we're creating online content to interact with you. So please chat right over there. And um, we have live operators standing by to answer your questions about this week's exciting episode on decomposers. What are decomposers? We're about to learn. All right. Well, we're going to get started with this incredible adventure out in the field with Rachel Rosen and Allie Britton. Here they go. See what you can discover. Oh man, I think I forgot my compass in the woods somewhere. I gotta go back and get it. walked down this trail. The compass should be somewhere around here. God, I never noticed how much stuff is on the forest floor. It's all these leaves and sticks. Let me look under this stuff. It's like, what is all this stuff? It just piles up. Where does it all go? Oh, here's my compass underneath all of this leaf litter. I wonder how it gets broken down. How does anything new ever grow? That's a job for the FBI. The FBI? Not that kind of FBI. I'm talking fungi, bacteria, and invertebrates. Oh, you mean decomposers. What is a decomposer? Do you know? Decomposers are actually anything that break up organic matter and living things. It kind of recycles the nutrients into new energy. Ah, of course. So there are three main groups of decomposers. Should we do some exploring and see if we can find some? Absolutely. <laughs> the natural world is full of energy. There's energy in plants and there's energy in animals. And there's a really unique way that this energy does not get wasted. And it's constantly recycled and it moves through this really unique system. Decomposers play a huge role in making this natural system happen. Here's an example of what the energy chain might look like in a forest in the Catskills. So we start with the sun and through photosynthesis it helps trees and plants grow. A lot of those trees and plants uh, grow fruit or nuts that little animals like rabbits might eat. Over here we have our friend the coyote and yes the coyote is going to eat the rabbit. Over here, we have our friend the coyote. He's lived a long, wonderful life, and then he dies. When he dies, those decomposers come in and help to start break, breaking him down. Uh, so we have the fungi, the invertebrates, and the bacteria, the FBI that we talked about. When he breaks down, he's going to turn into soil. And with that soil, new plants can grow. And that's why we don't see tons of piles of dead animals and trees all over the forest. We found a really great log right here that is definitely decomposing. And I know that because I can actually see the log turning into soil. So we're gonna look for those invertebrates. And I don't know if you remember from a few weeks ago in aquatic ecology, an invertebrate is any organism without a backbone. So let's roll this log over and see what we find. Aha! I already see some great decomposers. The first one I want to talk about is right here. Do you know what this is? This is very sticky. Is a slug. Slugs and snails 
are organisms that are great decomposers. Oftentimes you'll find slugs under rocks, under logs. Sometimes you may even find them in your garden. Slugs and snails are a group of organisms that are really great decomposers. They like wet, damp environments like under logs, under leaves, and sometimes on living plants in your garden. Slugs and snails are really unique because they have their very own cellulose digesting enzyme. So they don't require bacteria to break down the organic matter. Some people find slugs and snails to actually be a pest because they also enjoy eating your garden veggies. We're gonna put our friend back right here. And I see another really cool invertebrate. And this right here is a millipede. Millipedes are insects and they're also great decomposers. Other insects like beetles and ants also help decompose dead organisms as well by eating the matter and breaking it down. We're going to put this millipede back. It looks like right here is a really cool exoskeleton of a beetle, which is also a decomposer. An exoskeleton is really just the shed of a beetle. So this isn't the actual beetle, but we're going to put this back too. Another type of great invertebrate that you'll find that everybody knows and loves is a worm. There are over 7,000 different species of worms. Unfortunately, I don't see one right here, but I do know that they're out here. I do know that they are in the soil. Worms are amazing decomposers because they break down the organic matter and they also help the soil. Worms keep the soil permeable and porous, which really helps plants absorb water and nutrients more effectively. We're gonna roll this log back over and let these critters have their privacy. I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel, who's gonna talk about our next group of decomposers, bacteria. Let's go find Rachel. Wow, Ali, that was awesome. Now we're gonna talk about the bee in FBI, bacteria. Bacteria is everywhere. It's in the soil, in the air, in the water, it's even in our bodies. And it is a really important decomposer. At the early stages of decomposing, bacteria makes up almost 80% of the microbes that you would find helping to break down all this organic matter. Uh, even though you can't see it, it leaves a lot of evidence behind. So you can look for tunnels, evidence on animal poop, and even on organic matter like leaves and logs. So if you look at these leaves, you'll see that it has holes in it, discoloration. Uh, so all of this is the hard work of bacteria. Um, the last element in the FBI is fungi. So now we're gonna try to discover some fungi in the forest. Let's go. Hey, Allie, you wanna come look for fungi with me? Yes. Let's go. <laughs> I'm just out in the woods, you know, searching for fungi. No way. Stop. <laughs> what? We were just talking about FBI. The FBI? Where? <laughs> oh no, not that FBI. Oh. We're going to start covering the fungi portion right now. Oh, you're talking fungi, bacteria, and insects, huh? Exactly. Oh, okay. Would you help us look for some fungi? I would love to. Fungi are amazing, amazing organisms. You can find them all over. Um, we don't see them very often. They're very elusive, but they're all around us. Um, they are on our skin, they're in our bodies. They found over 101 species of fungi just in the human mouth. It's pretty amazing. 
And uh, so we're going to go out in the woods. They play so many different roles in the natural ecosystem that we live in. Um, they are decomposers, breaking down these different things that are around us. They're parasitic, feeding off of living tissue. Um, they can be what we call mycorrhizal, meaning that they have this connection with the roots of plants and trees. Um, and they can also be what we call endophytes, meaning that they live inside of trees and uh, plants and uh, have some symbiotic relationship inside of the plants in that way. Do you think that there are good conditions today to look for some fungi? I think there are always good conditions to look for fungi. Uh, fungi really like moisture. Uh, it is a little bit dry today, but you can always find something. You just got to look a little bit harder. I actually just found something really cool, um, but I think I lost it in the uh, leaf litter. Oh no. Um, it was a really amazing looking, uh, I think it was a very decomposed piece of dung, but it had all these little tiny mushrooms popping out of it. Um, and I'm hoping that I might find another one like that in Ooh, the near future. Gross and cool. That's right. Should we go see what else we can find? Let's do it. Yeah. Hey, have you ever seen a mushroom? why the fungus and the algae got married, right? They had taken a liking to each other? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hey, I got a joke for you guys. Oh yeah? Why was the mushroom invited to all the parties? I don't know why. Because he was a fun guy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh wow, so. What's going on here? Got a lot of decomposition going on here. There are a lot of different organisms. Some of them are fungi. Um, this is a specific type of rot. We call this brown rot or cubic rot. Um, sometimes we group fungi into different groupings depending on what they're decomposing. And um, some of them decompose the cellulose mainly and some of them mainly are decomposing the lignin. And um, this specific type of brown rot um, it decomposes the cellulose and leaves the lignin behind. And the lignin is this brown color. Um, and sometimes they call it cubic rot because it almost breaks off in cubes. Mm -hmm. If you look closely, you can kind of see it cleaves off and breaks in cubes. And if we lift this up, we might be able to see, we're going to lift it gently, some remnants of fungi, some mycelium. So mycelium is the main body of the fungus. It's filamentous. And if you, if you think about like the fungus as being a fruit tree, and then the mushroom that you see is like the fruit of that tree. Um, most of the time you don't actually see the tree itself when it's mycelium. Sometimes it's in the ground, sometimes it's in wood like this. Um, but it's releasing these different types of enzymes into whatever it's breaking down. They call them extracellular enzymes because they're released outside of the cell. And then those enzymes are using oxygen and other compounds to break down um, those materials and then the fungi soak it all back in and swim through it as they're breaking things down. Um, they have amazing, amazing compounds. All different fungi produce all different compounds and can utilize different parts and different stages of the decomposition process. And then eventually you'll have um, pretty much soil, some nutrified soil, and still fungi growing in that and breaking that down, releasing all those nutrients. And then the mycelium that's in the ground that's connected to the roots of trees and plants can pick up all that different nutrients, um, pick up the water that's in the ground and trade it with the plants um, for um, different types of sugars and things that the plants are photosynthesizing from the atmosphere. Wow, that sounds really important. I wonder what would happen if a forest didn't have decomposers. That would be probably a big old mess. The yeah. world would be very different. <laughs> Should we look for some more fungi? Yes. I would love to. Fungi. Try to picture the world without decomposers. What would the forest look like? There would be mounds and mounds of organic trash all over the place. It would be like a natural landfill. So here we have an old birch tree. Uh, this is a standing dead birch tree. And we have some decomposers on here. Um, these ones we call, this specific um, shape we call a conch. Um, these are woody conchs. Um, we call them perennial because they grow in layers year after year, and they're very woody, um, almost like wood. 
Um, this one is called the Tinder Conch, um, Fomis fomentarius, and it actually has a lot of history. Um, the um, man that they found in the ice in the Swiss Alps, um, they dated to 5,000 years, Otzi the Iceman, and they found a lot of different things um, just by studying his body, and on him was a specimen of this specific fungus, the Tinder Conch. Um, they think that he was using it um, possibly for therapeutic purposes, um, to heat up different points of his body because he was suffering from all different types of diseases. Um, but also, the amazing thing with this is that you can drop a small ember from your previous night's fire into this. Uh, you can burrow a little hole in it or even drop it right on the surface and it'll start to ember and you can blow on it and then you can put it into a pouch and it'll slowly, slowly ember throughout the day and then at the end of the day when you have a new location where you're about to make your new fire, you can flick it, take your knife or take whatever you have, a rock, and flick it um, out of the tinder conch, um, these embers, onto your new fire and start a new fire that evening, not having to start a fire from scratch every night. Wow! That, that's a cool survival tip. I wish you knew that last week I during know. survival class. Me too. You mentioned this is growing on a specific tree. Mm -hmm. Do mushrooms like certain trees? So some of them really are very specific and others are very um, kind of wide and vast in terms of what they can uh, decompose. Um, something like this, a tinder conch is most often found either on a birch tree um, or on a beech tree in the northeast. Um, but depending on the geographical location, some you know different varieties even within the species will grow on other trees. Um, Whereas things like oyster mushrooms will grow on a vast, vast variety of different materials. I mean, you can grow oyster mushrooms on cardboard or toilet paper in your own home if you want. Um, but oyster mushrooms are one of those really, really um, non-specific mushrooms that can grow on almost anything. And it has to do a lot with uh, the compounds that they produce. Um, oyster mushrooms produce a wide, vast variety of different compounds. So they're able to utilize all these different um, materials that they're breaking down. So cool. You think we can find some more? I bet we can. Let's check it out. Let's check it. Oh, wow. What is that? Wow. <laughs> I think I know what that is. Oh yeah, beautiful, oh, huh? Man. Those are really pretty. So here is another decomposing fungus. This one is often called reishi. There are many different species of reishi. They grow all over the world. This one is called Ganoderma tuge. Um, tuge, uh, tuga is the um, genus name of hemlock. Um, they grow almost exclusively on hemlock trees in the northeast. Um, sometimes you can find them on other trees, but it's very rare. Um, and they are decomposer, as I just said. Um, and they fan out in this way so that they can produce large amounts of spores on this under surface here. Um, many, many pores there that the spores fall out of and fly away in the breeze. I've seen this kind of fungi on a lot of my hikes. Is there something going on in the environment that is making them grow particularly? That's a good question, actually, Rachel. So, um, like I said, they grow almost exclusively on hemlock and um, in this area, in the northeast, um, we're getting hit really hard, all the hemlock trees, by an um, insect called the woolly adelgid. The woolly adelgid um, attacks the stomata of the leaves, um, or the needles of the hemlock tree, and eventually killing the tree. And so we're getting this large um, die-off of hemlock trees in this area, um, especially right now. And then also, it kind of depends on moisture levels in the spring. Mm. Um, and we had a really nice a uh, large amount of moisture in the early spring this year and it really soaked up into a lot of these logs and gave these mushrooms um, enough moisture to produce. Uh, mushrooms are about 70% moisture, similar to uh, humans, and so they really need large amounts of that water in order to make these beautiful fruiting bodies. How do you know when these mushrooms are fully matured? So also a great question. So um, these mushrooms um, have this outer white growing surface that you can see here. It's also on the bottom and they slowly mature and flatten out and that white growing surface slowly diminishes until at the end it's just, sometimes it's not even there at all or present and sometimes it's a very, very narrow bend, band around the outer surface and that's that growing surface that's slowly growing outwards and getting larger and making more surface for that uh, mushroom to produce spores. 
and pass on to the next generation. What's it feel like? It's quite soft. It's a lot softer than the early, the previous one we saw. It is very smooth. It's a little squishy. Does it harden over time? Um, they can harden a little bit once they dry out, but usually when they're um, healthy and mature, they'll have like kind of this slight sponginess. If you were to cut the top, uh, top of it, you could kind of push and it feels almost like a marshmallow or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look on this upper surface that is red, um, it looks very shiny and it's kind of just a little bit um, hard, tough. And uh, they call it the lacquer conch often, or the lacquer, lacquer polypore, because it looks almost like uh, somebody took a um, brush and brushed lacquer right on top of the mushroom. It also smells really good. This is one of my favorite smelling mushrooms. Mmm, <laughs> amazing. And often uh, there are things that come in, uh, insect called the pleasing fungus beetle, um, that comes in and it will nibble on this mushroom because it really loves this specific species. Um, and it will annihilate it sometimes. Huh. We don't really see too much of it yet right here, but sometimes you'll see it in high abundance in the woods. So cool. Yeah. Shall we look for some more fungi? Let's head back towards the covered bridge. Sounds good to me. It looks like a fruiting that? body of something. Luke, what is it? I think I have found this one before. It's a pretty common early fungus, early decomposer that you find on logs. It's huge. It has many, many different common names. Um, one of them is pheasant back. Another of them is dryad saddle. The scientific name is Cereoporus por squamosus. Ooh. And really cool looking fungus. Um, it's in the group uh, that they call black-footed polypores, and there are many different sizes within this black-footed polypore grouping. This is the largest one that I know of, and it's very fleshy. And if you look at the undersurface, it's kind of web-like almost. This one is very old. It starts to decompose, and then all the different things break it down, all the other uh, fungi and bacteria and things like that. Um, but often when this one is very fresh, it has a really unique smell, almost like the smell of uh, watermelon rind if you get your nose up close to it. At this point, it's kind of past that. <laughs> how Luke, awesome. Luke, how do mushrooms spread their spores? How do they reproduce? That is a great question. So there are many different ways that they uh, spread their spores. Um, within this grouping, we call these uh, basidiomycetes, and uh, that has to do with the um, structure that the spores form on. Um, the structure is called a basidia, uh, a basidium or a basidia for many and it's a club shape inside of the gills or inside of the web-like pores of this type of mushroom. They form inside and the spores form on these little four spines on that club shape and then they mature and there's this really unique interesting uh, dispersal method that they use uh, where they have a thin layer of um, moisture, often uh, mostly water, um, they think that it might be production of mannitol or different types of sugars that causes this um, layer of water to slowly build up, it slowly um, condenses out of the atmosphere. So if you can imagine a spore shaped kind of like this, you have this layer around the outside here, and then this little small droplet on this end here, typically. They call that Buller's drop, a guy named Buller discovered it. And slowly over time, this drop gets bigger and bigger. So it starts really small and it gets larger and larger as the water condenses onto it. And then it gets so big as the spore matures perfectly and gets a little bigger. And then when the surface tension can't hold up any longer, it breaks just like as if you would see like a droplet on a countertop or something like that. It can only get so big before the surface tension breaks and it connects with this layer of uh, moisture around the outside of the spore and when that happens it actually takes off so fast it, it accelerates faster than the space shuttle taking off with more G's <laughs> wow. no way. and it accelerates extremely fast and then it hits the column of air and it slows down so so fast that it's then slowing back down you can almost see them sometimes coming out of the uh, mushroom or out of the bottom of the mushroom and then it gets flowed away by the wind um, that's just one of the many dispersal methods that fungi use follow-up question can people grow their own mushrooms? And if so, how and where? That's a great question, Allie. Uh, yes, that is 
something you can definitely do. You can grow them in your backyard, you can grow them in your house. There are many different ways. Um, some of them are very low tech, requiring low levels of energy, um, and you know you can do it right in your backyard. And you can grow them on different types of logs, you can grow them on little beds that you create, can create for them. And you can also uh, inoculate your compost piles and create a whole living uh, fruiting mushroom pile that can give you edible mushrooms. We have a compost pile here at Ashokan. Should we go check it out? That sounds great. Let's go. Now, here we are at the Ashokan Garden Compost. This is a turning compost, and a compost pile is a really great way that humans can harness the power of decomposers manually. Compost is made up of green matter and brown matter. An example of green matter is plants and grass. An example of brown matter could be leaves or straw that we use in our beds for covering. And you wanna make sure that you can compost as much as possible. I mean, there's a lot of things going into landfills these days. Um, it makes sense to compost at your house because why would we throw things right into the landfill if we can just compost them and have wonderful soil to use for our plants? Yeah. Absolutely. Composts are, um, they're super easy to make one at your own house. This one, as you can see, is made out of kind of an old barrel. What is this, a garbage can? I think it's a 55-gallon drum. 55-gallon <laughs> drum, there you go. But you can make one out of an old garbage can, or you can do a heap compost, which is basically just a big old pile of dirt, and then you can throw your other organic matter in there and keep turning it. Um, within our compost, there is, if you were to take a little scoop, sometimes you can find those decomposers that we talked about earlier today. Does anyone remember what decomposers you wouldn't be able to see? That's right, the bacteria. <laughs> you might see some fungi. You might not, but they are there, I promise you. So it's hard to see, but there are actually tons of insects in here, which are the invertebrates. I see tons of ants. I see mycelium there. Ah, there's some mycelium. There's an ant. On awesome, there. here's an ant crawling on my arm. They say it's teeming with microbes. Yeah, they're hard at work in this compost, breaking it down to soil that we can then use in the garden. Um, Luke, do you have any suggestions for people that like to go out and maybe like harvest mushrooms or identify them? Oh uh, yeah, for sure. Um, there are a lot of really amazing books out there, um, especially for the Northeast. There's a really good mushroom book um, on identification um, that covers the Northeast in Canada. Um, that's, uh, I believe, made by Baroni. Um, that's a really good one. Um, but make sure that whenever you harvest anything, especially if you're going to eat it, you want to make sure you're 100% sure about what it is. Um, if you're not completely sure, always get a second, third opinion. Um, I'll have my contacts here um, if you ever want to contact me via Instagram or um, via my email. Um, I'd be happy to look at any photos or answer any questions. If you are ever sending photos, always make sure you get a photo of the underside, um, the spore producing surface of the mushroom or fungus, because that is a really big characteristic there. Thanks for joining us today, everyone, and back, back to, to you, Ruthie. Ruthie. <laughs> All right, thanks guys. Wow, I learned a lot today. That was a fantastic lesson. Thank you, Allie Britton, Rachel Rosen, and Luke Sarantonio. That was fantastic. and I. Thank you all for watching. Thank you to Mimi and Jess who were chatting over there. I really agree that sometimes mushrooms do seem like they're from another planet. I totally get that comment. And I want you all to know that down below we have some resources, some really cool links to follow to check out uh, more about decomposers, more of Story Lori's music, more of Luke's great photo photography on Instagram and information about mushrooms. He's got some amazing stuff on there, so definitely give him a, a follow. And you can also learn about the Mushroom Shed and that book that Luke just mentioned we found and put down there, so please check out the links. Um, next week is really cool. We're gonna have some cooking with Bill. That's right, our own chef, Bill Warrens, will be out on the grill showing you his favorite way to do uh, barbecue chicken, a kale salad, and some roasted potato wedges. So don't miss that next week. 
Also, uh, before we go, we're going to leave you with a song from our friend who lives uh, not too far from here. She's been at the Summer Hoot before. Maybe you'll recognize her. She's got a song about one of those decomposers. She's got a song about worms. Now, if I remember my FBI correctly, that's fungi, invertebrates, and uh, I mean bacteria and invertebrates. That's right. All right. So which one of those is a worm? Anybody? Let's see. It definitely has no spine or backbone. So I'm going to say worms and invertebrate. Let's hear a song about it from Story Lori. Bye. Hello, friends. It is Story Lori. It's a gorgeous day up on my mountain in Andes, New York. And I'm really excited because I am digging in the dirt. I'm getting up close and personal with some earth right here. And not just earth, but earthworms. Can you see these beauties? Oh my goodness, I hope you can. I think they're beautiful. I love the earthworms because they help the plants in my garden to grow. Do you like to plant a garden? Maybe you folks can share with me some of your favorite things to grow. On the count of three, ready? Shout out your favorite thing to grow in the garden. One, two, three, garlic! No, wait, kale, no broccoli, no ba- Oh my goodness, it's so hard for me to choose just one. Anyway, um, we're gonna sing a little song about the wonderful wiggly worms. Now that I've had a moment to go wash my hands inside after digging in that delicious soil, and I am ready to sing this song about worms. This song was written by my friend Lisa Atkinson many, many years ago, and I have enjoyed singing it for a good long time. And I hope you will join in on singing it too. It's very simple. The refrain, all you gotta do is go like this. Those worms, worms, wonderful worms. Those worms, worms, wiggly worms. That's it, that's simple. Let's try it again right now. Those worms, worms, wonderful worms. Those worms, worms, wiggly worms. Oh yeah, and you can wiggle around as you do it. You can wiggle high. You can wiggle up close, you can wiggle that far, you can even do the worm. Down in the dirt, they are working so hard, tunneling around in your own backyard, just hiding underground where they can't be found. Those worms, worms, wonderful worms, those worms, worms, wiggly worms. That's right, just like that. You'll get the chance again in just a minute. Those worms help plants in a special way. Making good soil every day Just munching up dirt and they never do stop <sighs> Those worms, worms, wonderful worms Those worms, worms, wiggly worms Oh yeah! No teeth, no ears, no eyes, no clothes, no feet, no bones Not even a nose, but they've got a mouth And they chew and chew, cause that's what those worms are supposed to do. Those worms, worms, wonderful worms. Those worms, worms, wiggly worms. Oh yeah, I love those worms. They help my garden grow. So when you're digging in the dirt and you happen to see one of those worms, just let it be. Thank it for the work that it does each day. Hey, let's take a moment and thank those worms on the count of three. Ready? Or oh, shout, thank you worms. One, Two, three, thank you, worms! I think they heard us. And sing this song as they wriggle away. Those worms, worms, wonderful worms. Those worms, worms, wiggly worms. Those worms, worms, wonderful worms. Those worms, worms, wiggly worms. Those worms, worms, wonderful worms. Those worms, worms, wiggly worms. Those worms, worms. Wonderful worms, those worms, worms, wiggly worms. Those wonderful wiggly. Uh oh, I forgot the last word. All oh, right. Worms. Thank you. Thanks for joining in. See you again soon, friends. Bye.